to start our study today uh, in 1 Peter. If you will open up your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 2. So important that we understand that the people that God was building up in the Old Testament and what he was giving them is the same for us today. God had taken a people out of bondage and he was building them up for a very special purpose. It's the same purpose that you and I have today. 1 Peter 2, verse 9. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a holy nation of people belonging to God that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. You are a holy nation, a people to be God's ambassadors, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, that we are to be God's ambassadors, that God is using us to make his appeal to those around us. Same thing that he wanted for Israel to be. He had chosen them not because they were a fantastic group of people that loved and adored him. No, he loved them and he chose them because of his promise to Abraham And he wanted to make them into this group of people that loved him so much and were blessed through the relationship that they had with God that he could use them to evangelize the nations around. We are called to do the same thing. If we are in Christ, Galatians 3, if we are in Christ, then we are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise, the promise that was given to Abraham back in the book of Genesis, a very high calling. And as we saw last week when we looked at the fifth commandment, God, people are everything. They're God's greatest treasure of everything that he has made. And the family unit is extremely important. That's why the enemy has attacked from every side the family unit. And family units so often, more often than not, are broken. And we have a world full of dysfunctional families. And therefore, God's purpose also is crippled. And we're going to understand more clearly today what God is expecting of families and how that so ties to the sixth commandment. First, go back just a few pages to 2 Timothy before we go into the Old Testament. 2 Timothy 3. Because I want for you to look at what happens when parents do not obey what God expects for them to do and how they raise their children. And Paul's very clear here in this letter to Timothy, uh, 2 Timothy 3. But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. And the terrible times are more than the things that God tells us that are going to happen in the book of Revelation. The worst that happens in the end times is this. It's what happens to people, what people become. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. The King James says, which says disobedient to their parents, that they lack normal affection for their families. It's missing. There is no affection for their families. And a lot of that is because parents are negligent of their responsibility, and negligence has produced a self-centered society. The greatest gift that parents 
can give their children is a happy marriage. And the only way to have a happy marriage is if Christ is at the center. For things only provide happiness for a short time. Oh, sure, things can provide some amount of happiness or joy, but not for very long. So we're going to look, we're going to go back to where we left off at Deuteronomy 6. It's okay, the microphone's loud, I can talk over her. Don't you worry. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Because this is where we left off. And this is what God was establishing. 6-4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hand and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. What God is is telling his people is that he, he and his word are to be their life. These words that I am giving you are to be your way of life. And if you don't make this the way to live, there is disaster coming, as we see today. Disaster on the family unit. Parents are to be the models, not just for how to follow the Lord, but they're also to be the parents of how to honor their parents. We cannot expect our children to honor us as they become adults and get older if we have not modeled what that looks like. So God is expecting generation after generation to be an example from one generation to the next. Honoring parents has brought up a lot of questions, and I wanted to address a few of those before we head into the Sixth Commandment, because it is such, when I said last week that, you know, love your neighbor as yourself, it starts at home. Your parents, your family, the people in your house, they're your first neighbors. They're the neighbors you live with every day. And then out, you know, extended family, grandparents and on and out as the circle gets bigger and your church family and so forth. But it is so important that we take that seriously. The Bible doesn't say honor your parents if they're good parents and they did everything that you wanted them to do. If, l- honor your parents if they were loving and kind. And one of the questions we had at Q&A last week was, you know, what about difficult parents beyond not just difficult, but abusive parents? The fifth commandment gives no outs. Honor your parents, period. And so how do you do that if you have been raised in a household where the, your parents or your, a parent was an alcoholic, a drug addict, an atheist, emotionally abusive. So how, well, you know, what do you do with that? There are ways of honoring people even if they are not in your immediate presence. One of the ways that we can honor parents that have been difficult, and that's putting it mildly, is to not talk badly about them. Do not tell everybody that you meet how horrible your parents were. Because you know what? That's what your children will grow up to do. They will be like you. From one generation to the next, we teach by example. And so love means forgiving, love means patience, and love means kindness. Love is kind. And so when a parent is in need, we help whether they deserve it or not. And there are, there are times where pe- parents make choices. If, if you have the type of parent that, you know, has, has abused, abuses drugs, alcohol, whatever, and they 
are dangerous to be around, that you can't have a relationship with them because of their choices. You can't allow them to be around your family because they could hurt your family. That, that's just a fact for a lot of people. But it doesn't excuse us from honoring. One of the ways that you can honor a parent that you're estranged from is to pray for them. It's not easy to sincerely pray for someone who has broken your heart and caused you pain. When we pray for people, we are wanting God's best for them. Do you know what it takes for a child to pray God's best for a parent that has hurt them severely? The Holy Spirit. It shows what is going on in the heart of that child. So honoring parents was a way that God intended for one generation to care for another and to be an example from one generation to another so that the oncoming generation would not be so disrespectful and basically clear out the older generation. God protects that generation by saying, you will honor your parents. And as they get older, children are to look after, we looked at that last week, you, we look after them in whatever way that the Spirit moves. We are supposed to be walking in Christ. So we are supposed to be allowing the Spirit to move us, to do things we may not want to do because it's God's way of love. You and I are being tested every day on if we love our neighbor as ourselves. And if we can't love our neighbor as ourselves, then how can we say that we love God? We see our neighbor. We don't see God. So it's extremely important. God brought something to mind this morning. I thought, wow, Lord, that is really cool. You know, that's one of the reasons that we need meditation with the Lord in the morning. I thought of a really awesome um, example that I could share with you all about honoring a parent. Because one of the questions that we had is, what about in-laws? And I'm like, okay, young adults, if you don't want to have to honor in-laws, then don't get married. When two people come together and they get married, does the Bible say once you get married you don't honor your parents? Nope. Now you have four parents to honor. Because husband and wife support each other in honoring that parent. In being, you know, including, as we move on and we get married, we continue to include our family. And we trust them and we have respect. And we ask our, the el our elders for advice. And we take their advice into consideration. And if you have a parent that wants to give you advice that you're not asking for, that you're willing just to listen. That's respect and that's honoring. To simply listen and to say thank you. Because parents love their kids. And they want the best for you. And sometimes they just don't do their very best in showing it. And sometimes we give opinions that nobody asked us for. But we can honor parents in so many ways if we will walk in the Spirit. But I thought about a great example about do we honor our in-laws and how that works in, because I know that that's... Relationships are complicated. They are. Uh, just family relationships within one family without any marriage involved with the children, but then once the children get married and pull another family in, it's the more people in a circle, the more problems. Or the more blessing, depending on how you choose to look at it and how you choose to accept it. But I wanted to share this when we're talking about in-laws. When my mom was nearing retirement, um, she was having a really difficult time with one of her supervisors. And all of you that know Grammy know her character. I mean, she is not, she's not like me. Um, She's very quiet, and, and she's very humble, and her superior was just giving her all kinds of stress, and she didn't think she could continue to work anymore, and she wanted to retire. But they had borrowed some money against her retirement, and if she retired early, then she would lose so much it wasn't worth it. She needed to keep working to, you know, to replace that and build it up and then retire. And 
it was stressing her out so badly, it was affecting her health, and Kelly and I could see that. And so you know, I sent a letter off to the principal and to the superintendent and everyone involved saying, this is going on and it will stop because this is not going to continue to happen. But Kelly went beyond that, and he said, we need to give your mother the money that is needed so that she can retire because we can't have this going on with your mother. Your mother needs to retire. Well, the money that was needed was every penny that we had saved at that point. We, we, probably we'd been married five years maybe. And we had $10,000 saved up because Kelly had saved it up. He's awesome. He saved that up before he even met me. And so really he had saved up that money and he gave it to my parents so that my mom could retire. And this morning when the Lord brought that to mind, I said, Lord, that is so awesome. What a beautiful example of being selfless, seeing a family member in need, and moving Kelly's heart. The Spirit moved his heart to do that. That's honoring. It was a test for Kelly at that point. The Lord tested his heart. And the Lord, as I look back, the Lord has blessed him unbelievably because Kelly was willing to do that. It's God's way. And families are to take care of each other, one generation to the next, doing this, talking about the Lord's ways, talking about being faithful to God, being devoted to God serving God together. And then when the babies come, the grandparents are involved. And so there's always the generation to generation walking along in the Lord's way, being ambassadors, being this holy nation of families serving God together. That is God's plan. Of course, we know that sin came in with Adam and Eve, and their very first child was a murderer. And everything went awry. And we have a nation of people that are self-centered and know nothing about honoring. So with that said, let's go to Exodus 20, verse 13. Only four words. You shall not murder. What that word murder is, and this is a very difficult subject for many people, but what God is saying is that we are not to take life unlawfully. The word that is used here in the Hebrew, and that's one of the things that you and I need to do when we study God's word, is not just read it, but study it. Look at it. Go and look at what God was saying in his language that he gave them. What is this talking about? You will not kill unlawfully. God is the giver of life. You and I live right now because God has given us life. He sustains us with his word. Every breath that we take is a gift. God gives life. God can take life. See, the problem with the world today is God's plumb line of what love is and what love is not has not only been so lowered, it almost doesn't exist anymore. So that when we talk about a life having to be taken for just purposes, people just go up in arms. And we're gonna, we need to look at that because God established capital punishment. God ordained it. God gave a prescription for life, joyful life. It's found in his commandments, but the commandments are a very um, minimum of what God expects love to look like, as we're going to see as we dissect this commandment. Let's first look at Genesis 9, because God speaks this, long before we get to Exodus. This is right after the flood. 
And I want to remind you why the flood came. The flood came because the world was full of violence and corruption. Corruption meaning total immorality, no values, no integrity. The world was full of corruption and violence. Verse 6, whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God has God made man. Life is sacred. You can go back to Exodus 20. Life is sacred to God. He gives it. But because he is the giver of life, he can say when someone cannot live anymore. That's just God's sovereignty. I talked about God and how he sees the family unit. So I want for us to look at this lawful killing through, very, through a very difficult place. Look at Exodus 21, verse 15. Anyone who attacks his father or mother must be put to death. Anyone who attacks his mother or father must be put to death. When you look at what murder is, murder is unlawful killing. Me choosing to take your life for whatever reason. And if you look at it in a grander way, it's always somebody's child taking the life of somebody's child. Someone's child is taking the life of someone's child. And what does that bring but just sorrow and anger and more violence? So God prescribed, first of all, that he expected for families, for parents, to raise their children in his ways to love, and that discipline was part of that. Those of you that are parents, you know that. Discipline is part of love. God disciplines us because he loves us. And those parents that think they can't discipline because they don't want their children not to love them have totally lost their responsibility and accountability toward God. And what they're going to reap down the road is what we're seeing in today's world today of disrespectful kids that care nothing about anyone but themselves. And God had a formula back then of what this was supposed to look like whenever parents, children were disrespecting parents to this degree. Look down a couple of verses to verse 17. Anyone who curses his father or mother must be put to death. This means they're threatening to take the life of their parent. How many times have you read just in the last several weeks about children taking the lives of their parents, being so upset that their parents didn't give them what they wanted that they took their life, having absolutely no respect, no upbringing. But how are these children being raised? That's serious for your child to be put to death because they have so gone, gone so far they can't be reached. This isn't just a, you know, your child makes one mistake, they're to be put to death. This is telling us that a child that parents have tried and tried and tried and tried to bring around, and they refuse, and they are totally rebellious. Let's look at the process for that, how that is. But before that, let me just read verse 23 here, just down a few verses. If there is serious injury, you are to take life for life, Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, bruise for bruise. You get what you give. It was to be a deterrent of harming others. Paul says in Romans 13, 10, love does no harm. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Go over just a little bit to Deuteronomy 21. And let's look at how God prescribed for the family unit to operate. We read that. And what's to happen when the family unit, the children become disobedient? 
God protects the family by giving parents certain authority. So if you had a child that refused to come around, that was threatening you, this is the prescription, 21 verse 18. If a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who does not obey his father and mother and will not listen to them when they discipline him, his father and mother shall take hold of him and bring him to the elders at the gate of his town. They shall say to the elders, This son of ours is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey us. He's a profligate and a drunkard. Then all of the men of his town shall stone him to death. You must purge the evil from among you. All Israel will hear of it and be afraid. Parents didn't have the right to exercise this. They brought their child, and you know, this is after a very long time of trying to get a child. Everyone has known child, grown children like that who abuse their parents over and over again, and they are living lives of just total rebellion, and their parents have to choose tough love and kick them out of the house. You, you're, you can't live here anymore because... Everything that you do is harmful to me. Well, in this case, they brought the child before the elders of the, the tribe. Because, you know, God had given each tribe their land. And they brought the child, and it was investigated. First, it had to be investigated. It had to be proven. And, of course, that child was going to be given an opportunity to make things right. But if a child refused, all the men in that town partook of stoning the child. Now, there's no evidence in the Bible. It doesn't say that that ever was carried out, but this is what was said of what was supposed to happen. And this is called lawful killing. It is not murder. Murder is taking life unlawfully. I get angry at Jocelyn, I kill her. That is murder. Crimes of passion, murder. Not lawful killing. Capital punishment is society eliminating evildoers. And yet how many times have we seen states that have the death penalty where instead of focusing on the horrible crime that was done to the victim, the focus is on having a vigil before, you know, they get destroyed through lethal injection or whatever. People are holding vigil and holding up signs, you know, murders, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, what about the reason they're dying for? They tortured and raped a child. They killed this many people. What about the victims? But this is what has happened to humanity. We are soft on sin. God says over and over again, show no pity. When everything has been done that can be done to bring a life around and they refuse, what else can be done? See, this is an example of what God's going to do at the end. And you and I have to be willing, back if we lived in this day, to do what God prescribed had to be done to eliminate sin growing deep roots, and again having this violent world that God had to destroy through a flood. That is why the world was destroyed through a flood. The world was so contaminated with sin, with violence, with the wholesale value of life. There was no value for life. That God was grieved he had even created mankind. Go back a few pages to Deuteronomy 13. 